Well, good evening. I welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to our Good Friday worship service this evening. Uh, if you have not been to a uh, Good Friday service here before, we uh, you can see the bulletin. It's a little bit different. Just a quick word of explanation. We uh, are going to combine a series of uh, scripture readings uh, dealing with the different uh, aspects of Jesus' death tonight, uh, and for the most part, follow those up then with a uh, song that we will sing together, uh, a cappella, uh, to uh, sort of capture the Old Testament uh, build up to uh, this great and, and glorious day. So, uh, it, it, and then we'll have uh, communion afterwards. So, let me uh, let me pray, and we'll uh, begin. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, we uh, ask now your blessing upon our time together tonight. We uh, claim your promise that your Holy Spirit will be with us. Uh, we pray, come uh, Holy Spirit and uh, be with us here now. Uh, quiet our hearts, uh, focus our attentions upon uh, you, upon this great work of salvation that you have accomplished through your Son, Jesus Christ. Uh, may we never forget uh, the great lengths that he has gone to uh, and the great love that he has uh, showed to us in his life and death and resurrection. Uh, we pray now that uh, you would uh, guide us and direct us uh, through uh, our service this evening. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. First lesson, betrayal. And when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I'm not speaking of all of you, I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I'm telling you this now, before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send, receives me. And whoever receives me, receives the one who sent me. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do quickly. Now no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had a money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast. 
or that you should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. La 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 Judas, 
one of the twelve was leading them. He drew near to Jesus and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And when those who were around him saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, No more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and the officers of the temple and the elders who had come out against him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. Please uh, stand as we sing. to my voice. I would send in what is truth. I 
after he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to him, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the, other, the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters and again said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me. You do not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement in Aramaic. Yadatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him, and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisted together a crown of thorns. They put it on his head, and put a reed in his right hand. And even before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him. And they took the reed, and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe, and put on his own clothes, and led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came up, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink. Just stand while we sing. This is a little bit of a less familiar tune, so I'm going to sing through the whole tune here first before we begin.
So they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called, is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each shoulder, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scriptures, which said, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. Please stand while we sing. Israel. 
Let him come down now from the cross. Then we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way.
with me to the book of 2 Corinthians. We want to take just a short look tonight at a very appropriate passage for this evening in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 through 21. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, making God his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is God's holy, inerrant, and inspired word. Sometimes God takes us to the very last place you ever thought he would take you. And some of us know this uh, all too well, the death of loved ones, the loss of a job, uh, uh, separation from uh, a loved one, an addiction perhaps, uh, you name it. Uh, oftentimes, uh, God will take us to these places and you can't help but in those places think, why, O oh Lord, have you brought me here? And surely, as we have been reading through Jesus' uh, arrest and betrayal and trial and uh, his murder, all along, uh, Jesus, I think, had to be thinking, Lord, this is probably the last place I ever imagined uh, that you would lead me. But we see from 2 Corinthians 5, I think, why, at least for Jesus, he was led to this place. And the reason is, is because of our sin. Our sin separates us from God. It's not just making God unhappy. It's not just breaking a few rules that we'll get around to making right on someday. No sin is separation from God. And we're told in the scriptures that we all, like sheep, have gone astray, each and every one of us, fallen short of God's glory, we've fallen into sin, each one of us. We are born sinners, and therefore we sin. But you see, the problem is even greater than that. You see, we don't just need forgiveness of our sins. If we were just forgiven of our sins through Jesus Christ, we would simply be back to the point where Adam originally was. No, we need more help than just that. In Isaiah 53, a passage that coincides uh, so very well with 2 Corinthians 5, we read what we need. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's our problem. That's our greatest problem in life is that how can we get rid of this sin? And so we're showed here in this passage that God, through his son Jesus, has reconciled uh, us to God. And reconciling us to God, it took 
Jesus going to the cross, but uh, as I said already, forgiveness is not simply enough. The problem of sin is so deep that we need righteousness as well. We need righteousness. We, uh, we need that right standing with God. Not just forgiveness of sins, but we need righteousness as well. And we see in this great passage that Jesus provides that to us also. Sin is separation from God because we have broken God's law. And God's law is extensive, it's mighty, it's huge. We need an advocate go before us to fulfill God's law on our behalf. And we see in this text that that's exactly what Jesus did the night that he died. That he had loved us to the very end. And in loving us, he took God's law upon himself. He was born under the law, born in human flesh because the law applies to human beings. And so Jesus, in his 30 plus years of life, went about fulfilling God's law perfectly. Never once sinning, which, uh, to be honest with you, makes it all the more remarkable. I think Pilate saw a glimpse of this, maybe more than a glimpse, finding him innocent. What charge can we lay against this man? For he was. He was perfect. He was perfectly righteous according to God's law. And he does that so that we can exchange our sin at the cross and receive his righteousness. To the very end, Jesus was faithful, fully faithful to God's full law thereby attaining perfect righteousness so that when you and I put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are not just forgiven of our sins, we are certainly forgiven of our sins, but we are also made righteous by claiming this righteousness that is not our own. And we're told in verse 19 that this is the way that the world is reconciled. That separation is erased, that uh, we are reunited, if you will, with God, able to come into his presence. If you're a student of the Bible, you know that this is uh, the great conundrum throughout the scriptures. How can unholy, sinful people come into the presence of God? Moses trembled and made up excuses not to go. Isaiah cried out uh, that he was unholy, and an angel took a coal and touched his lips, symbolizing him being made righteous and able to enter into God the Father's presence. We claim the righteousness of Christ so that we can stand before God and before man as blameless, as though we have never sinned, as though we have never broken one of God's commandments, we stand in the righteousness of Christ. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And then there's this great question, I hope that is hovering around in each of our minds tonight. The question of why, why would God do this? Why has God done this? Why has he sent his son to die in such excruciating ways? Why has he taken his only son to a place where he thought God would never perhaps take him? And so you see here that it wasn't the envy of the Jews that caused Jesus' death. It wasn't the spite of Pontius Pilate that sent Jesus to the cross. It wasn't 
those 30 pieces of silver and Judas's greed that sent Jesus to the cross. Brothers and sisters, make no doubt about it in your minds that it was God the Father's will that Jesus would die. And this may be hard to grasp if you've never heard this before. This may seem sinister and cruel. But as we look and as we read tonight and as we sing these uh, prophecies fulfilled in Jesus Christ, know that it was God's will in order to pour out his love upon his children, you and I. That there was no other way to reconcile you and I to God except through God the Father's will of sending his son to the cross. God made him sin and punished Jesus. He took on the curse. He became the curse itself so that we might be set free from our sins and become righteous in the sight of God. As we think on this, we really should blush we need to ponder this again and again and again. That my sin and your sin is so great that it required such an immense and amazing sacrifice of the only Son of God to free you from your sins, to forgive you from of your sins. And it took the perfect life of a perfect mediator to make you righteous in the sight of God. And that's where we stand tonight. We stand in the righteousness, clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Loved by God. Loved immensely by Him. Him who did so much. Sending His Son to take upon our sin. And to give us His righteousness. What a great and glorious God we serve. And let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this gift. We thank you for this gift of salvation. That you have forgiven us not just some, but all of our sin. You have given us the gift of Christ's righteousness. We thank you and praise you and ask that our lives might reflect this morning, how we think about others, how we treat them, and the ways that we forgive those that sin against us. Father, continue to hold the cross ever before our eyes as the greatest symbol of love that the world has ever known. Thank you, Father, for loving us so much as this. We pray in Jesus' name. I could ask the uh, elders to join me in the front again as we prepare for the Lord's Supper.